Hello, I am Tiffany Marley, Vice President for Practice Transformation at the National Community Action Partnership. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar Wednesday, Leading Through Innovation, featuring Mojave Atlas Community Action. As we begin today's presentation, I would like to invite us to ground ourselves in the promise of community action, which is CERT. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. And so, I would also like to invite us to turn our attention towards the Learning Communities Resource Center. Uh, this effort really aims to help community action agencies analyze outcomes and identify effective, promising, and innovative practice models that alleviate the causes and the conditions of poverty. At the end of the day, our project aims to help build community action agencies' capacity to fight poverty more effectively. I must also uh, say that today's presentation couldn't happen without a wonderful Learning Communities Resource Team, Learning Communities Resource Center Team. And you can see all of their wonderful faces and names listed there today. So I thank them for joining me and particularly thank my colleague, Hyacinth McKinley, who is serving in the production role on today. And so next I would like to give acknowledgement and important attention to a special initiative called the Community Action and Economic Mobility Initiative. It is an effort that is funded by the Andy Casey Foundation and has really given us an opportunity to invest in intensive technical assistance to support 10 agencies who were seeking or are seeking to advance a whole family approach. Uh, the initiative is dedicated to breaking the cycle of intergenerational poverty through the whole family approaches in community action. So within with that in mind, I'd like to invite us to take a few moments to go a little more deeply into a conversation about the whole family approach itself and particularly um, begin to answer the question, why a whole family approach? And here's our response to that. Our response is that our children are our future and also our children do not exist within a vacuum. They exist within families. And so um, if, if we are going to incite a new reality for children, we have to do so through the families of which they are a part. With that said, let's take a moment to look at the current state of children within our society. About 15% or 12 million children live in poverty. Our youngest children are the poorest. 60% of poor children live in small cities, suburbs, and rural towns. And then two in three poor children in related families live with an adult who works. And this is information provided to us by the Children's Defense Fund Ending Poverty Now report. Let's take a closer look. In particular, let's take a closer look at children of color. While projected to be the majority by 2023, Children of color are disproportionately impacted by poverty, resulting in the lack of access to the opportunities and resources that they need to thrive. And this is as conveyed by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation report on a business case for advancing racial equity. The truth is that growing up in poverty undermines healthy child development and can perpetuate negative impacts for a lifespan. So every year, we leave millions of children in poverty in our society. Our nation experiences $700 billion in lost productivity and increased health and crime costs. And so as we, as we, as we look to the future, uh, 
and particularly in, in light of the, the trends that we have, have just heard, not only uh, is the social and economic future of children and the families of which they are a part of at stake, the truth is the future social and economic security for all of us is at stake unless we do something. And as we think about this whole notion of the whole family approach and innovations like it, it is these kinds of interventions or efforts that really seek to interrupt that 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 statement that I just offered to us. And really the whole family approach invites us to look towards a new vision. A new vision that really pushes us to achieve results beyond anything we have achieved before. And it starts with this whole notion of meeting families not where they are, but meeting families where they dream. Additionally, there is a focus on maximizing people or families' potential to contribute to the civic, social, and economic lives of their community. Additionally, it's about producing a legacy of family well-being that passes from one generation to the next. And so really as we think about the whole family approach and innovation like it, the end game is to accelerate social and economic mobility for families. And achieving this vision will require us to, 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 to do beyond anything that we've done before, as I've already said, but also this vision, this vision for many of us requires a deeper engagement with families, being data-driven, person-centered, trauma-informed, particularly giving attention not just to equity, but really starting with racial equity, being brave, being brave enough to innovate and achieving greater impact. So very quickly, let's take a moment to talk a little bit more about understanding the whole family or two-generation approach. And this is the way we define it. We define it as building family well-being by working with children and adults and the adults in their lives together. And the results that get achieved are that efficiency is improved and outcomes are enhanced for parents, children, families, and communities. And so as we think about applying the whole family approach lens, an important consideration is that all human beings have the ability to change and really change and evolve during the course of their lives. And in addition to that, given the appropriate support and the appropriate resources, all human beings have the ability to live up to their fullest potential. So as we think about that and think about that within the frame of the whole family approach, then it's safe to say that families also change and evolve over time. And Families have the potential to grow and to change, and with the appropriate support and the resources, families also have the ability to live up to their fullest potential. So providing integrated, high-quality, intentional support to parents and children at the same time through a whole family approach has the potential to improve both parent and child social and economic well-being, producing a legacy of family well-being that passes from one generation to the next. And here's some good news. There's science to back that up. And so there is new brain science that is out that says that not only um, children who have experienced certain levels of toxicity at an early age, not only do their brains change with um, certain supports and interventions, but their parents' brains also change at the same time that really um, leads to some, some groundbreaking um, possibilities uh, for the family. And so as we advance to the next slide that illustrates the ASCEND 2Gen continuum, ASCEND from the Aspen Institute, uh, they, as they talk about the approach and where to start, they really um, invite us to focus on the center of this graphic because the intent is as we think about 
how what our first steps are as it relates to the approach, it really begins with placing families at the center of our assumptions, our thinking, our beliefs, our efforts. And while maybe historically an organization may have been primarily child focused or may have been primarily parent focused, the aim is to to transcend all of those elements in between to ultimately get at uh, what the family needs and really work in partnership with them to drive change for the family. And so on the next slide, Ascend's theory of change uh, says the following, that when, like a family forms, and really a family is what a family defines itself to be, so that's an important thing to assert. And that together, all members, the children, the adults in their lives, the entire family, when they're able to draw on education, economic support, social capital, and health and well-being, when this occurs, current and successive generations enjoy economic security and stability. And so as we look at the next slide, we see the, um, the what we call the wheels or the cogs and the ascend theory of change. And you know, I'll just state them again. I won't elaborate on them because our wonderful presenter who's with us today is going to elaborate on those in context for us, for us today. But I just want to emphasize that 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 combination or that cocktail of services or resources. Um, that agencies really need to integrate in an intentional way, in intentional way are early childhood education, post-secondary and employment pathways. And I'll say early childhood education is primarily focusing on children, and then post-secondary and employment pathways are focusing on the adults in their lives, which includes education, skill development, accessing jobs, and those supports. And economic assets having to do with um, stabilizing um, the family's resources, helping them to maximize the resources that they have, tap into additional resources that maybe they haven't tapped into, and then maximizing those dollars that are earned that ultimately um, place the family on a sustainable financial traje positive trajectory. And then this whole notion of health and well being, which really um, attends to both the mental and physical um, needs of children and parents and just the, the, the wonderful opportunities that are provided um, for children when this is addressed for them to learn and play and to thrive and then also for the adults in their lives to, to bring their best selves to parenting and um, also to um, consistent um, engagement with work or what they do in their everyday lives. And then the final piece being social capital, which is the family's ability to tap into those relationships, to build relationships and networks that um, give them a different kind of social resource um, that is sustainable for them as they navigate the various aspects of their lives, but also um, serve as an opportunity as the family evolves and grows and strengthens to give back. So to be involved in civic engagement and to be involved in leadership and really giving back to other families for the sake of the entire community. And, you know, maybe this is a good time to mention that as we think about this approach, it's about moving families forward, interrupting intergenerational poverty, and um, improving the lives of families. But the truth is when families' lives are improved, the communities of which they are a part of are also improved or transformed. And so very quickly, let's take a look at the two generation or whole family approach characteristics. They are as follows. Uh, agencies that engage in this approach center on families, they integrate services, they remove barriers, they coach, so they shift from that case management approach to a coaching approach, they partner internally as well as with community partners to collaborate to meet the needs of, of families. They center their efforts in equity, particularly racial equity, and they measure child, parent, and family outcomes. Again, I won't elaborate on these characteristics because today's presenter 
uh, is going to elaborate wonderfully on these, and I really don't want to steal her thunder. And so here's a final consideration that I'll leave for us as we think about this whole notion of the whole family approach and its benefits. It is Dr. James Heckman, who is an economist, who says, there is a 13% return on investment in high quality early childhood for each year of a child's life. And a college degree doubles a parent's income. So we, when we think about this and just the, the ripple effect that it can have in the lives of children, the parents, and the whole family, it's, it's a very powerful notion. And again, there are several examples out there that affirm this, um, but I will just leave you with that. And so as we look at the next slide, uh, I want to let you know that today's webinar is a part of a series called the Leading Through Innovation Series. And the participants of this, this series have participated in the Learning Communities Resource Center's Learning Community and the NEK Community um, Economic Mobility Initiative. And so we will be able to hear from several agencies from the whole family approach community of practice as well as our Implementing Innovative Practices group. And so today it's featuring the Hobby Oswa Community Action, um, also in the lineup of the Metro Community Action, Enrichment Services Program Incorporated, Aristic Community Action Program, Central Missouri Community Action, and Metro Action Commission. So with that said, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Liz Wapala, who serves as the Executive Director of Mojave Oswa Community Action in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Liz, I am happy to turn the platform over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, it's good to be here. I thought before I start, I'd, I'd like to just say just a little bit about me. Um, Liz Kwapala. I, I grew up on the Iron Range of northeastern Minnesota, one of 10 kids. Um, the Iron Range the economy was, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. The economy was really up and down, and so our family struggled um, when the economy was down during those years. We turned to Head Start for services and energy assistance, and, um, and what I learned from that experience was that people who have low incomes have the same potential as anyone else, just not always the same opportunities. And so that really grounds the work I do and I think the work of everybody throughout community action all across the country, is that we really believe in creating opportunities for um, the folks we work with. A second thing to know about me is I'm deeply grounded in my Finnish American culture um, there's a spirit of the Finnish people called Sisu, and it really, it, it says when the tough get going, like this is a secret sauce, this is a secret juice we tap into as Finnish Americans and as Finnish people. And so I just have a strong appreciation for the role of culture or having some deeper belief or feeling or spirit in your bones that you can really lean on in hard times. And so I think, um, Many of us, it's many different things for all of us, but for me, that's just a critical thing that I bring to my work every single day. Um, so with that, we'll move into this. A little bit about our service area. Mojave Ottawa um, serves, uh, we're about 200 miles northwest of Minneapolis and St. Paul and um, serve very rural counties. Our name stands for the first two letters of the five counties we serve, Monoman, Hubbard, Becker, Ottertail, Wadena. Our services are very traditional community action types of services. Um, $17 million annual budget, 150 staff. Our organizational values are unique to us, but I think shared in many ways with others our community action, or our values at Mojave Ottawa are to be client-focused, community-minded, and resourceful. Client-focused, community-minded, and resourceful, and then we think when we hit those, we're in the center of those three, that's when we're doing things, um, getting things right. So, 
when we started on our journey that led to the whole family community of practice, I was fairly new at Mojave Ottawa. I've been here just over three years. And I had a question for board members individually when I met with them. And I said, if you had $17 million yourself personally to help end poverty and create economic opportunity for people, how would you invest those dollars? And we had just very real conversations with each of the board members. And we really grappled with what are the best strategies for ending poverty? And then they had a question for me. They said, why is it that we sometimes serve the children and then the grandchildren of Head Start families? If we're ending poverty, shouldn't we be ending the cycle for more families that we're working with? And so we decided to take those two questions and go into a year-long exploration that really led us to the good folks at the partnership and the whole family approach. Um, and led us through this moving beyond crisis management, both for the way we serve families, but also just the way we function as an organization. It seemed like our families were often in continual crisis. The pressure that put on our staff meant our staff was operating from a place of crisis too often, and our communities were from a place of crisis, or you know, in crisis. So we wanted to move from a regulative towards a generative mindset, and then from a, a place of scarcity to abundance. And so we'll walk, walk through this transformation with a couple of stories. So we had two innovations we came up with. <clears throat> That's really changed, changed our lives as an organization, even though we're just getting started. So the first one was just a new way of looking at the old crisis to thrive scale. And so everyone's familiar with this old crisis to thrive scale or the one that community action has been using for many years. So they all look slightly different, but crisis, vulnerability, safe, stable, thriving, some have 11 measures, some have 22, um, been used around community services block grants since the beginning of time, I think, in Head Start programs. We worked with families and with our frontline staff and came up with a slightly different approach to this. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking through this. It might be hard to see on the slide, but we'll send out a handout that's easier to see um, with a follow-up to the webinar. So we looked at the same five levels, but in order to really focus and triage our efforts, we said if folks come in at level one, um, we're identifying level one as four types of crisis. So they're either homeless, a chemical dependency crisis, mental health crisis, or domestic violence. If they're in one of those active crises, we need to triage that and work to address that crisis right away before we can move on. And then level two, that moves them to level two, or they might come in at level two. This is where we sign them up for any benefits that they might qualify for, both within our organization, public, private benefits, the free meal that might be at the church or a food shelf or you know whatever kind of benefits. We want to make sure that they're aware of them that they have application assistance and support, that they understand, of course, it's up to the family to decide what they want and what would be helpful for them. But we want to provide, not just make a referral, but really help them navigate that. And then once they're signed up for the benefits they, they want, that moves them to level three, or they might come in at level three. This is what Tiffany described as a secret sauce. This is relationship-based coaching. And so we really want to get to know our families really well during this time, and we ask them to pick one of three goals. Um, one is with a, the parents pick an education goal, and these are for children, for families who have children in early childhood education programs. <clears throat> so the parent might pick an education goal. It can be finishing their high school diploma. It can get be getting a PhD. It can be English as the second language, whatever their education-related goal is that has an ability to help them move towards 200% of poverty, or they can pick an employment goal that helps them get to 200% of poverty. So it might be, you know, starting at an entry level, but with the idea that they're gonna build some skills and move up, move up the line, or it might be helping work with the courage to ask for promotion or, or find a different, you know, different line of work or something, anything around education that the family wants to pick. The third goal, is broad category and it's just or anything else so it's education employment or anything else and this is because many of the families we talked to they said you know my cancer diagnosis 
is the most important thing for me to work on right now, or, you know, my sobriety is something I need to focus on right now. And we respect that. We honor that. Whatever the thing is that's most important to them, maybe getting their children back out of foster care, we want to support them through this relationship-based coaching. Once someone knows what their goal is and they're making significant steps on this path, that moves them to level four, or they can come in at level four. And this is asset building. <clears throat> we define assets broadly. So it can be financial assets. It can be their health, physical, mental, emotional health. It can be their connection to culture. It can be housing, um, backup childcare, backup transportation, friends and family network. Um, we do the wheel of life assessment and they pick which of the assets are most important for them to work on. Once they're working on some kind of asset development, and for all of us, it takes a lifetime of building. So we just want them to be on a path, be having some confidence around that. And then that moves them to level five, or they can come in at level five. And this is giving back, leadership development, volunteerism in the community, met, peer mentoring, lifting others up, working for us, you know, any, any of that. Then we recognize, too, that all of us, even as we're climbing up these steps, we have setbacks, we sometimes fall back, and um, we respect, we honor that, and then we just help move forward again. But it helps us identify where people are at and helps, um, helps us move them to the next level. So one thing that's interesting for me about this is it helps us think less about what funders want. Of course, we want to keep our funders happy. The funders want to know what our enrollment numbers are, how many people signed up for this service or received that benefit. What we want as the organization is to see how many families are moving up from what level to what level and what kind of community supports we need, what kind of services we need to provide. So this is our first innovation. Um, come back to that later. The second innovation is related to this relationship-based coaching and the platinum rule, which is treat others as they want to be treated. And so we recognize that our clients are fully complex human beings with strengths and gifts and potential, and we're really working to view them through an intersectional lens, through all the levels of complexity. So I'm going to walk through a few things of what this innovation, our second innovation, means for us. This is a confusing slide, but we'll walk through these one at a time. Um, so for us, seeing someone as they want to be seen means that we simultaneously focus on all of these aspects. Family voice, a whole family approach with integrated high-quality services, trauma-informed care, an equity lens, and moving towards generative on the human services value curve. We do this all at the same time. Um, so, and we see this as different ways of looking at the same issue of how do we meet people where they are and take them to where they dream. So I'll walk through these um, one at a time to spend a little more time. So when we set out, um, Last year, we looked at our at our data, and so we're not real proud of these numbers, but this is where we were at. We just anecdotally, when we look at our Head Start families, we assumed that most of our Head Start families receive many of our other services because we're, you know, co-located in the same building in many cases. Um, we know our colleagues. We refer to, you know, refer each other. But when we looked at our data, we found that only 5% of our Head Start families were accessing our family planning program in the past year. Only 8% had received our free tax aid services. Only 44% had received energy assistance. And only 9% had received, this is a Minnesota State program, Family Homeless Prevention and Assistance Program, which is a very flexible resource to help people who are struggling with um, making their rent. So, um, <clears throat> So our takeaway from this was, whoa, we can do better. And so we've um, worked at cross-training our staff to make sure staff understand what the different programs are. Um, many of them filled out applications just to make sure that they can do the application assistance with families that they're working with. 
and um, really just a big focus on that. And then we um, created a data analyst position that can really just keep an eye on this and help us all, program staff and administration, understand you know, how we're doing. We set goals for this year and are excited to look um, this spring um, at our final numbers, but really excited about where things are, where things are headed. Another part of our whole family approach, so that was the dark side that we weren't yet connecting with folks. Um, we created a CLIMB initiative, so this is to focus on those folks at level three who are looking towards education or a job with a goal of reaching 200% of poverty. Um, and so with this relationship-based coaching, we're working on things like the wheel of life for them to identify their goals, strengths finder to really tap into their strengths, created an incentives program so that we can help people, um, you know, with gas tokens, gas cards and that kind of thing, um, sort of as a reward for reaching a goal. Um, everybody needs them and too often we were waiting for them to come and ask and, you know, and that just creates all kinds of inefficiencies. So we've been working on that, um, regular check-ins weekly at least with our families, trying to help families and ourselves learn from setbacks people experience to see, what, see where we can improve. Um, added coach positions to um, reduce caseload sizes for our staff and then added a coach mentor position to help those coaches just kind of debrief and strategize together about how they can best help help families. So that's the CLIMB initiative. Um, equity, um, our work has to be centered in equity uh, um, for us to really help end poverty. So a few things we've got going on, we've got a long way to go on this. And in fact, in the diversity, equity, inclusion work, I think our, our efforts so far that I'll lay out have really focused more on diversity and inclusion, but we're doing that to hopefully be able to shape up organizational state and national policy around equity. Um, so our board has added some, um, has been doing a study about impact of race and they've added some, or as board positions have become available, really prioritize adding um, folks of color. So now one third of our board are people of color or indigenous folk. <clears throat> we added a, or trained one of our staff to become an IDI qualified administrator. And so this is just a cool tool. If you're not aware of familiar, I encourage you to Google it, look into it, the Intercultural Development Inventory. It's an assessment that you can take with a qualified administrator. Um, it shows you where you are on your ability to embrace difference from a continuum denial, like difference, there is no difference. Polarization, one group is better than another group. Minimization, where we talk about, can't we just all get along? We all bleed red, we're all human beings, can't we just get along? To acceptance, where we accept that there are differences, but we don't really know what to do with them. To adaptation, where, um, where we learn from each other and because we work together, um, we do better. And so the, this assessment tells you where you think you are on your ability on this continuum and then where you are according to the assessment. And most of us think we're a little further ahead than we actually are. And so then the assessment, the results give you a action plan on how you can move since you already think you're there, what kind of things you can do to move forward. And one of the things that they tell us we can do to move forward is just introduce ourselves to cultures that we might not be aware of. And so we have a film festival, it's Black History Month, and so at our, at our offices on Fridays, we're showing the movie Hidden Figures about the black women of NASA who helped us put a person on the moon. But, you know, Native American History Month, we did Trail of Tears, just a range of different things we've done for our film festival. We also try to recognize um, agency-wide just by an email and discussion um, recognition days like National Coming Out Day or Day of the Dead is just an opportunity to learn, be introduced just a little bit to a culture that we might be a little less familiar with, but that our clients and people in our communities live every day. Another section of this or another way of looking at how do we meet people 
um, where they're at and treat them the way they want to be treated is a deeper understanding of trauma-informed care. So we have a booklet our staff put together, this trauma-informed continuum. I'll send this out with follow-up email as well. Um, but it's been, I, I'm just super excited about this tool. It helps us like the IDI, it helps us understand where we are and then how we can move to the next step. And so um, just quickly over these slides, um, we can move from we really don't know about trauma to ACEs and general basic knowledge to a mindset shift to actually developing strategies and policies to then building community and peer support for addressing trauma to a community-wide integrated systems approach to working with folks in trauma um, to then really tracking outcomes and moving on to continuous quality improvement. So there's next steps no matter where you are, where you find yourself. Um, this work has been guided by or informed by Jim's four leaders work and his um, trauma-informed school, but we've been working with some of our community um, broad sectors to work through this continuum. So that has been transformational for us. And then this is a trusty human services value curve. When I first came across this, I joked with our staff, not really joking, but I wanted a tattoo of it because it really seemed to me to be the direction, the exact recipe for how we needed to move out of um, business as usual to a way that would really get great outcomes for our families. And so regulative, um, for folks not super familiar, I'll just go over this real quickly, but regulative, just in my interpretation of it, is you do what funders want to do, want you to do, just to kind of keep funding. That's where the focus is. What do the funders want from you? We got to keep our grant. We can't lose that grant. So let's just make sure we're doing that, reporting those kinds of outcomes to collaborative. And this is where often we're working with others in order to maybe bring more resources in the community. Integrated, we're working with others to get better results in the community, and then a generative, where this is where we're really working hand in hand with families, low income families, to identify what is it they want, what kind of community do they want to create, and how do we create that together, and how do we bring in resources. Of course, we do that. We can't have a generative model without also following rules, working with partners, creating better solutions and outcomes. But moving in this direction has really helped us um, focus on community impact and family voice. Which brings me to some things we've been working on with family voice and tools we learned from our experience with the community of practice. But really the idea of family voice is putting families in charge themselves. They know what they want best. They might, um, it might be hard to see because they might be um, impacted by trauma or hopelessness. And so it takes some coaching, coaching with folks. By thinking about family voice, <coughs> we've also learned how to listen better to our staff who work directly with families. So we listen to families, but we listen more carefully to the staff who are working directly with families. We have many of our staff who used to be former clients. So we've done focus groups and discussions just with that cohort to understand from their perspective, having been a former client or current client and former st and current staff, um, their input. Deed internships is just, um, so we got some funding from Minnesota state government to create positions for our clients to work in-house at our organization in different tracks. So we have an IT track, an early childhood track, nursing, um, various tracks so that they can get some work experience in a paid internship and see if this is an opportunity for them or, or they'll take those skills elsewhere in the community. We've really focused on building staff capacity so that they can um, feel empowered to work with families on what families want. And so this employee training series, we, we train all of our staff on these things, but but the idea is that we really can all be responsive to coming up, not, not to memorizing regulations, though regulations are important, but really so that we can be adaptive 
to um, coming up with new ideas and new strategies to really help move families up and out of poverty. So all of that just was my second inspiration that we've gotten from our involvement. And so now I want to reflect just a little bit, um, two years into this transformation work, what has changed. And I want to say before I go into the details here, that it's been mostly a culture shift, um, a new way of looking at the crisis to thrive scale, a new way of looking at how do we treat families the way they want to be treated. Um, but culture shift can be measured as well. And so we've seen an increase from 66% of our staff to 91 saying that, that we make clear, the organization makes clear what our priorities are and how, you know, and what's most important. Um, from 48 to 74 percent of our staff say they have access to data they need to make decisions. From 53 to 75 percent, so we still have some room to improve obviously on many of these, but um, they say our organization improves key processes to, to do better work. Um, and then our turnover rate has decreased from 25% in 2018 to 14% in 2019. So while we've been through a period of rapid change and you know, what might seem kind of chaotic to take this from many different angles all at the same time, um, I think it's, we've proven that we can do that in an intersectional way, um, comprehensive way, while also having staff um, bringing them along and having them feel connected to the organization and our work. We've seen some results in the community as well, brought some resources into our rural community, received some recognition from some of our key partners, developed a pipeline I spoke of with our apprenticeship program. One of my personal favorites, it's kind of petty, but I just think it's such a great measure, is our Facebook page went from 300 followers to over 2,600. And one reason I really, 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 really love this is I just think Facebook is one very free, cheap, community-minded, resourceful, client-focused way of reaching both clients, potential staff, volunteers, a way to share community resources. And the way we've done this is just by having all of our staff, you know, share things and, and promote our page. And so it's really been a collective effort, but one that makes me happy. <clears throat> While we're early in our transformation to see real results for families yet, um, we have 40 families screened for the CLIMB initiative, the relationship-based coaching. Um, we have four apprentices working in those tracks, and we've had 12 graduates of our employability initiative, which was just a small pilot to see how can we support folks in their effort to increase their wages over time. Some organizational changes that we've seen is we've added more family coaches and the coach mentor and data analyst position, um, mentioned professional development, really focus a lot of training um, resources and we want to do more on what does it mean to do relationship-based coaching, um, talked about the incentives program. So some aha moments for us on our journey is um, when we started, our staff um, were really, really overwhelmed with all of the work they had to do. And there's so much work and there's so much need. Our communities have a lot of poverty. Some of the most impoverished counties in the state are in our service area. And so when we first started these conversations, the feedback I got from staff across the organization, I feel, you know, along with a deep passion to do more, obviously, if we could, was that it's impossible to do more. We've had more and more and more put on us for ages. And by working, by developing small teams of folks to tackle different parts, by keeping a focus on our values, I feel like now the thing staff tell me is that they're impatient to do more, let's get this thing rolling. Can we do more? Can we sign up more apprenticeships? Can we, can we help more people? Um, so really slow and steady, I think, um, got us through some, and, and you know, we still, we still need 
to comb through just some of the work. There's a lot of forms that change, the way we track data, the way we input data. There's a lot, but um, slow and steady wins the race. Um, we think just spending time um, figuring out where we're going, where we're at, where we need to go next um, to help us stay focused um, has been helpful for us. Really focusing on organizational culture, values, outcomes, and, <clears throat> and then making sure we create the staffing positions we need as we continue to evolve our, our approach has been very helpful. So I wanted to share, we also tapped into resources that the National Partnership has had to offer and has. So wherever you are in your journey, um, we found these helpful, kind of tapped into them pretty early. So the Code of Ethics, um, there's 12 ethics, and we focus on one each month. They're on the Partnership's website. And um, so I wrote a director's dish about that ethic in our monthly staff newsletter. Many of the staff teams um, took discussion questions that I recommended from you know, others in the network but, and talked about that ethic and really dissected what does this mean for us? Um, what does it mean to serve the best interests of the poor? What does it mean to keep yourself informed about what's going on um, on issues of poverty? What does it mean to really believe in investing in professional development for our staff? Um, what do those things mean and what do they mean in the context of this journey we're on towards the whole family approach? And then what, and so we, a lot of focus on the ethics and we think that's a great place, a great intersectional <laughs> way of starting a, um, if, if you're not using that tool, um, a really easy one to pick up. We also took advantage of the Pathways to Excellence process through the partnership. And um, this was a different committee. So we have a bunch of different committees doing a bunch of different things. But I think by going through this process, so for folks not familiar, this is where you do a comprehensive assessment of where, where you are according to all of these different measures of excellence and how you stack up. The idea is how, you, how your practices and policies at your organization stack up to the very best practices and policies of the very best organizations in that, you know, on that topic. And so I think what it did for us to simultaneously work through the Pathways to Excellence process is it created a culture of continuous quality improvement. We know we can't fix everything, but when we're digging hard to see where can we do better, how can we do better, um, that has led to, helped us, I think, think through more generative approaches. And so highly recommend that. The Certified Community Action Professional, um, CCAP, we hadn't had any CCAPs at our organization. Um, we did three one year, added two more, we've got three more. So most of our leadership staff now have their CCAP. And, um, and so it's helped us really have a shared understanding of the history and vision of community action and given us a strong base to really lead some of those generative approaches. And when we can think about what happened in the 60s and what happened in the 70s and the 90s and why did they do that thing in the 80s, it's helped us think ahead to 2020 and 2030 and beyond. The whole family community of practice, I just cannot say enough good things about the peers we had, the support from the National Partnership staff. Um, there were 10 cohort member agencies that I think we'll be hearing from in the months to come, but um, just when we were stuck, it seemed like they always had it figured out or they had an answer or they tried something and, and that just built a community um, that I can't say enough about. And then we had a different team get us connected with a poverty simulation. So this is from um, Missouri Community Action for folks who aren't familiar, but we, got, we trained I think seven or eight of our staff to be able to do the community action poverty simulation to train our staff, to begin to train some of our community partners and really root our work, ground our work in the real struggles of families. And so that's been just a powerful tool um, that we've put to good use as well. Other tools we found helpful outside of the network, um, Tiffany mentioned Aspen, uh, Ascend at the Aspen Institute, Annie Casey Foundation, just wealth of resources. 
Minnesota state government, Minnesota was one of the four states funded through the National Governors Association um, to do two gen work. And so they have a policy network we were able to tap into. And then the Future Services Institute based out of the University of Minnesota, but really doing work internationally on service integration um, have been good partners to us as well. <clears throat> Next steps for us is we want to continue to work on uh, universal intake and what does it mean to do intake at each of those five levels? What are the questions we ask? How, how do we collect data once and then use it many times instead of having a bajillion different forms? I know many of our peers across the country are ahead of us on this. We look to you and, and others to really try to figure out how can we take what you've already figured out and um, put it to work here in a way that meet our needs. So um, that's something we've got ahead of us. We want to continue to refine our data tracking and, you know, data is only as good as the information put into the system. And so how can we make sure we're asking the right questions? And then we want to figure out too, how do we continue to track data? We know that for people to reach 200% of poverty, which is the goal the board set for us um, a couple years ago, some of them aren't going to reach that outcome while they're a Head Start family or while they're accessing, you know, our current services. And so how can we track these families and stay in touch with them after they leave our regular, co you know, um, intensive coaching model? And so we're, we're trying to figure that out. We have some ideas, but working through that. Um, and then we want to just continue to make improvements, listen to families, figure out what parts of our coaching model are working for them, what's not so helpful, and continue to um, refine our model and build better community resources, figure out what policies need to change at the local or state level um, to just help families um, get ahead. So some lessons we learned, there's no one right way of doing this work. It's messy, but if you stay grounded, you assume good intentions on everybody's part and you focus on just always moving forward, um, you can make big things happen. Part of our um, dream team here um, at Mojave Atwa, our whole family team has really been folks up and down the organizational charts, people working across the different programs. They've come together every week for a 30 minute quick check-in. We serve 5,000 square miles, so many of them dial in by phone, um, but they've been doing this 30 minute check-in now for nearly two years, I think, and, um, and just kind of making sure we're always m moving things forward. All of them are busy, all of them have other full-time jobs, but I'm a strong believer in this, just real quick, small check-in, taking notes, moving forward so things aren't getting lost. And so a big shout out to all of my colleagues here who have really been the drivers of this work. And with that, um, happy to take any questions or comments or advice you might have. So Liz, it, I think people are typing in all of their questions, um, but I did want to share a comment that we've gotten um, in. You are already getting some kudos from your community action colleagues on uh, the great work that you've done and they can see all of the intention that you and your team have put into a lot of what you discussed today. So wanted to share that with you as folks might be uh, typing in their questions to share. I'll just say too, if folks are typing, um, one thing I skipped over and, and didn't mean to, um, it's really important to the work we do. Within the five counties um, that we serve, White Earth Nation um, Indian Reservation is within our five counties. Um, Serves, I mean, covers all of Manoman and Becker, a very significant, or part of Becker and all of Manoman, a very big part of our region. And so we've been trying to build intentional relationships um, with folks at White Earth and just really trying to understand how we can work together, folks, whether they're White Earth tribal members or not, um, descendants or not, we're all people of Minnesota, people of this region. And if there's resources that we can offer as community action, we need to be doing that. But also, they have 
thousands and thousands of years of experience living in these communities and have a lot of solutions that I think we can benefit from and trying to figure out um, how to maximize that partnership is um, an intentional part of our work and something the board of directors, they've even been talking about changing or exploring changing our bylaws to require a section of our board to have, you know, be represented by White Earth Nation. And so I think that level of commitment along with some formal partnerships and informal partnerships um, so that we can learn from each other has really been a central part of this work as well. So Liz, uh, this is Tiffany. Can you talk a little bit more about um, some of the intentional efforts that you made to ensure that your leadership and your staff um, were up to speed about um, their general understanding of the approach and then also um, the, the agency's efforts to advance the whole family approach. Can you say a little bit more about that? So several things. I think one is we've had, we've had a Head Start, early Head Start child care partnership program for a long time, you know, since, um, since those programs started. And, and, and we're fairly innovative. I think back in 1986, I think it was that we opened, or it might have been 1996, we opened a Head Start program um, a center at the local community college so that we could help um, provide high quality services to children while their parents were going to school. And so that's two of the years. What, what I think we wanted to focus on is how do we take that with a more intentional approach? What additional partnerships do we need? How do we focus not just on the school readiness goals that Head Start has kind of moved to in the past couple of decades, but how do we focus on really the whole family moving forward? So we started, as we do all of our um, deep conversations, we started with the board of directors and talked about our mission is um, helping people achieve self-sufficiency. And so what does self-sufficiency mean? And what does it mean in this community where, um, you know, with very strong um, Native American culture where, um, it's the opposite of self, you know, like it's, it's a community in some ways is the opposite of self-sufficiency. And so what does that mean for us at Mojave Ottawa and how do we move forward and, and how do we define that? How do we help each other? You know, like um, I personally have never been self-sufficient. You know, I've always relied on people. And so through those conversations, we talked about um, heading to 200% of poverty and then looking to our families to our frontline staff and others on what will it take to help families move from where they are now up to that 200% of poverty. And so um, the webinars have been certainly helpful. We've been able to participate in trainings um, regionally. We had Tiffany come out and um, talk at our all staff meeting. Um, so we've had, you know, just a whole bunch of training and I think readings and and really just thinking so that people didn't have to get hung up on, you know, all the details and rules of what a whole family approach is. Really just thinking from a human level, what, how, what partners can we learn, you know, to tap into better and what's working. We, we came up with a few pilot projects. One was this employability initiative. So we said, let's just take one of our communities, focus, um, work with employers, talk to our employers about what, what does it take for people to succeed at your business? And what does it take when people fail? Like what's present? And then from those conversations kind of came up with some um, advice, I guess, or like ways of thinking about just, just employment from two different perspectives. So someone tardiness, for example, if, if someone's tardy, um, you know, when they come to work late, they might feel like they did a really good thing because they stopped in our very rural community and helped someone fix a flat tire, and they might feel like really good about that, and they get to work, and then they're docked for showing up a little bit late. And so, you know, kind of understanding how, how do two different, you know, uh, how to kind of communicate across these different cultures. Um, cell phone use is another thing that, you know, how do employers see cell phone use? 
how do young parents see cell phone use and how can we you know, like how can we understand how each other see it and how can we support so this employability initiative was really looking at how can we help people work with employers listen to employers talk with employers also work with employees potential employees and really try to bridge those differences and understanding kind of a little laboratory pilot program. We did another pilot program that was just built around social capital. So we asked church, church members, community members, business people, volunteers to pair up with a low income person in their community and kind of come, come to um, these classes and learn together about <clears throat> Yeah, um, love and logic, or you know, and just kind of learn about resources. So a story I just heard this morning was the other day um, at one of there was a bowling event where these folks came, low income folks, middle income folks who were kind of pairing pairing with them and just kind of building community together. And um, one of them, they're both sewers, these two, and one of them needed some kind of pattern from another one, and she had it, and so they were connecting after the event to share that. And I think. So that, just trying to understand how do we build community across things has been helpful and we did it at a small pilot level. And another last, and I'll take some questions, but another pilot level thing we tried was just understanding more um, intentional relationship-based coaching. So we gave a smaller caseload to just one of our staff to just really focus in on community partnerships. So when you when you can really drill down on what a family member, you know, could benefit from, what the barriers are, and you have time to really think about that and time to research community partnerships and who might offer that or what, you know, what might we be able to bring in, um, that, that was helpful too. So I think we took a variety of approaches um, to getting where we are. And we still, you know, still have work to do, I guess. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, this has just been very informative, and maybe you've spoken to this a little bit, Liz, but you know, I'll, I'll frame it this way. Um, uh, like, what advice would you give to an agency that is just starting to think about whole family approach and just starting? To ask the question, you know, how do how do how do we do this? How do we get started? Um, now that you have the experience that you have, um, what would you say is the first thing, or some of the first things that agencies need to think about, or some of the first things agencies need to do as they're trying to get started at the very beginning? Well, we um, great question, and we thought of this, and and I think um, uh, it's frequently talked about as whole family isn't a program; it's really an approach. And so, mm -hmm. how can we uh, how can we like work towards an approach? So that's one thing. But then thinking about how do we change up the way we've been doing things, you know, with a new approach that is so big and hard to get your head around. And so um, we, I just highly recommend starting with a small group of folks, you know, identify a small cohort and, um, and then see with that little handful of families, what, what systems would look like, how, how could things look different, what would staff need training on, what resources do families need, what, um, you know, we partnered with Urban Institute on a study of low wage workers who had left employment sometime within the past 12 months. And we found from that, they just, they interviewed a bunch of workers and asked like why they left. And, and we got from that just a treasure trove of information on, you know, what employers need to know, just even about the laws, about, <laughs> about how they're treating people. And, and you know, and, and so partly that and partly related things, we ended up bringing legal aid into our office to have office hours. They've been a close partner forever, but when they're in our office, our staff can just drop by and ask them, you know, questions like, does this feel, does, you know, what about this, what about that? And so I think both things, think of it as an approach, not a specific program. Don't put just one person in charge of developing a whole family thing and because then you'll just have another siloed program. But kind of build a team, think about a small group of families, and, um, and then what could change um, or not. We also 
um, as we were thinking about it, um, many of our coaches we look to as content experts. And so some of our staff oh. are just more experts at helping fill out Section 8 applications or understanding how to navigate okay. math. And so I think lining up what, what do folks already know and what do they do good, and then how can you move toward that? But I think looking at the specific building blocks of a whole family approach, um, there's the, uh, I'd be remiss to not mention the guide, Tiffany, that you guys had, uh, the, can't think of what it was called, but it's how we, that toolkit you put together on designing a whole family approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The design plan. Yeah. So that's that's how we started. Yeah, we exactly. just we, with the these thirty minute check ins with our whole family team. We just worked through. There's just a bunch of different questions, and we just took thirty minutes each week, and we just got through you know whatever question we could, took notes on it, and then moved on to the next one. And so that's on the partnerships website, the whole family design plan, and um, really recommend because it it starts with where are you now? What services do you have for children? what services you have for adults um, that really a great place to start and it's been a great tool for us and help lay out the whole direction I think wonderful thank you so much for that wisdom um, Randy has a question that has come in from the audience we'll make this our last question Sure. So, Liz, there's a bit of an intro to kind of give you a heads up. Um, but one of our attendees would like to hear a little bit more about, um, let's see, how you uh, maintained uh, some of those weekly check-ins that you talked about um, in meeting with your families, given some of the challenges of being in a very rural area. Particularly, they talked about some of the issues that they have with transportation and Internet access. So uh, can you speak a little bit more to how you were able to navigate those challenges and in, um, in your ability to maintain that close, uh, consistent check-in with your families as a part of your pilot project? Yeah, so we have, um, we have offices and centers, Head Start rooms, and scattered all across our service area. So that helps. Um, that helps us a lot. Um, but then also, um, you know, trying to meet in person, or our goal is meet in person a couple times a month and check in some other way um, by phone. Uh, we see windshield time, giving someone a ride, you know, to the grocery store or something. That's a, uh, something very much needed, and so you can use that windshield time as good time to check in. Um, so no easy answers. It's true. I mean, some people have cell phones, some people do not. Um, so just being as creative as possible. Well, Liz, thank you so much again um, for sharing. I want to remind our audience that this Leading Through Innovations um, presentation is really a series, is a part of a series, and so you all have had a wonderful opportunity to hear from Liz. Liz, that was just so amazing, very informative, and we are excited about curating this in our resources um, at the Learning Communities Resource Center and sharing that uh, with community action colleagues in the field. Uh, in addition to that, uh, everyone listening today can expect to hear from some of Liz's other uh, colleagues who will also be sharing um, their stories of transformation through this Leading Through Innovation series. And so we have upcoming um, Lane Metro Community Action, Enrichment Services Program, Aristic Community Action Program, Central Missouri Community Action, and Metro Action Commission in the coming months. And so please be on the lookout. Information about this series will be available on the Partnerships website at www.communityactionpartnership.com. So Liz, you are truly a star. We appreciate you and thank you so much again for taking the time out to join us for today's webinar Wednesday. We want to also remind our listeners and viewers that next week's webinar Wednesday 
is focused on encouraging communities to participate in the 2020 census. That is just vital that our entire network get engaged with that effort, and this webinar will give you an opportunity to learn more. Additionally, on March 4th and 11th, uh, our energy partnerships will be hosting an energy and health partnership part one and two webinar. And then on March 25th, our next Leading Through Innovation presentation um, from the CEO from Wayne Metro Community Action uh, will be shared. And so we thank you all so much for taking the time out of your very, very busy days, your busy day. You didn't have to take the time, but we appreciate you learning and sharing and growing with us at the partnership. So thank you again and make it a very great day. Take care. This concludes today's webinar.